Trust finally sat down, so I think we can make a start. Uh, good evening, all, and welcome to Chasm, and welcome to 2024, and welcome to everybody here and our guests out in television land to the January meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Ottawa Centre monthly meeting. Uh, my name is Mick Wilson. Some of you know me from a previous reincarnation or incarnation as meeting chair. Uh, bad luck, I'm, I'm back and uh, looking forward to another fabulous year of, of herding cats and keeping these meetings going. In that spirit, uh, I was planning to wear my patriotic best. You might not be able to see this terribly well, but it's a combination of Canadian and Australian motifs, and I thought that was entirely appropriate for this sort of official role, but I'm told that it's not adequate. And so I think this is the first striptease in the history of RASC. I am now phaser fodder for the next shooting at Star Trek with the official red shirt of RASC. So give me a round of applause. For... Thank you. Okay. Chris, we are stuck again. Okay, uh, usual preamble, this is being recorded. It will be available for um, future historical research. Uh, chat box comments can be seen by all if you're coming in on Zoom. Uh, the raise your hand is disabled and we do not monitor the chat box. Q&A questions will be dealt with, but not the chat box. So... Me, Mick Wilson, Dave Chisholm follows with the uh, Skies for January. Paul, in a redux of his failed attempt to inform us last November, is again presenting on the geology and astronomy of Canada. We have the break. Jim will uh, give us his views of the anatomy of a sunspot, which I think is a fascinating subject. And... I'm curious to see where it leads us. We have our observation reports, monthly challenges, and the usual slew of announcements. Uh, Chris, is that an unusually long list, 99 members last year? Okay, so apparently we're doing something right. And uh, welcome to all those who have joined in the last year and welcome to our new members in the last month. Gary Boyle, in the news, this was his uh, radio interview regarding the Geminids, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, and uh, widely appreciated and well-received. So well done, Gary, as usual. Membership benefits. For those of you who are new to the centre or are thinking of joining, uh, and the really good question is, why would you bother? I would argue that being here, being in this meeting is probably the key benefit that this is your opportunity to learn from and exchange experience and skills and techniques and enthusiasm with a bunch of like-minded people. In our council meeting last night, there was a lot of discussion about the possibility, for example, of holding workshops to for the people who've gotten a new telescope for Christmas, sitting in the wardrobe since last Christmas, who knows? But at least be able to bring it along to a special sort of workshop session, learn how to set it up, learn how to get the finder centred, maybe later on deal with issues like collimation and so on and so on. This is the group where you can learn those skills. So look around, find the people that you think look most intelligent, like this lady over here with the glasses. She's a lawyer and she's the one pushing for these workshops. So she'll be talking about that later. Uh, normal list of benefits. We have a very, very well-stocked telescope library, the Ted Bean Library. Uh, it's been doing gangbusters business over the last year or so, so on. Uh, a lot of new equipment coming in, a lot of new uh, ongoing maintenance being done and a very, very high demand for the telescope library. So as a member, that's something that you have access to. Out the back here behind the curtains, uh, we have the uh, Stanmott Library, 
That's our collection of books, DVDs, physical materials. And that's usually open after the meeting for 20 minutes or half an hour. I'm not sure whether Estelle's here though. Sure. Oh, good. Okay, it will be open. Thank you. We have the various observers programs run by the National RASC. Uh, you can learn certification and different observing skills, um, observational techniques and so on. And we have the Fred Lossing Observatory out near Almond. It's our um, dark sky site. Very, very well equipped. Number of permanent, uh, permanently fixed telescopes out there. And again, as a member, you are able to take advantage of that facility or even bring your own equipment out and simply take advantage of dark skies. Printed publications. There's the RASC Journal, which is a, it's still quarterly or bi-monthly. Bi-monthly, uh, it's an electronic edition. For an extra fee, you can get the print copy. There's the annual observer's handbook. Uh, and then there's our own RASC Ottawa newsletter, Astronotes, um, which Gordon over there is responsible for editing. So if you've got any ideas, you can approach Gordon tonight. Meanwhile, the lawyer will address us at, at no cost. Yes. Hi, I'm Andrea. I'm um, on your council, and I'm here to talk about a new membership benefit, the Rask Ottawa Discord server. Basically, a Discord is sort of like a, a, a the bulletin boards of old. It's meant to be a decentralized form of communication. Right now, we have the email list, but it's a little intimidating to send an email to 400 members. And so the idea of a Discord is once you join, you can find uh, the topics that interest you, find like-minded people, as well as uh, people who might have the same equipment or live in the same part of the city as you do. The Discord um, app, which you will have to download, and you can download it on your uh, desktop computer or on mobile, Discord recommends that you first start with the desktop version. We will be sending out a link to how to download Discord. And then this is the tricky part. You must get an invitation and you click on the invitation link. That will help keep the Discord server uh, safe from attacks and hackers and make sure that it's a place for our membership only. The Discord app generally um, emerged out of the gaming community, and they have less tolerance for privacy and information theft, uh, theft, identity theft, and monetization. So we feel it's a pretty safe place uh, for our membership. So two steps, you download the app, then you click on the link. The link will be an Astronauts. The link is only valid for seven days. So if you don't get to it within seven days, don't panic. You can send me an email. I will send you a new link. This email address is a combined personal and work email. So if I don't respond to you the first time, you can email me again and again until I answer you and uh, I won't be upset. But I have a lot of spam filters. So use the word discord in your uh, subject line. That's the how and the what, and now I'd like to talk about the why. Um, as you know, we are a very big group. There's a pretty small number here. There's a small number on Zoom. I'd like to get more people involved. If you are a new member, please come and join the Discord and ask a question. If you're an old and experienced astronomer, please come to the Discord because you will answer those questions. I know this group, and I know there's so much knowledge and and they really love to share their knowledge. If you have a technical problem, come to the Discord because we are all sort of troubleshooters by nature. If you identify as a female and you would like to meet women astronomers, come to the Discord. You may have noticed that we're kind of in the minority, so I would like to meet more of you. And another, um, as Mick alluded to, and I'm wrapping up now, we are planning on some workshops. We are planning to have people help uh, set up their telescope, astrophotography workshops, processing workshops, collimation. The Discord is the best way for us to identify people who have that interest and to communicate directly with them. Uh, that's 
Uh, there's probably a lot more to say, but we'll leave that for the Discord. So please join and keep an eye out for the link in Astronauts. Thank you. There you go, join the Discord server. So all these wonderful benefits come at a cost, but it's well worth it. $103 for a normal, regular annual membership, $97.50 plus per head cost for a family membership, and $62.40 for students under 25 or just youth under 21. So sign up now, get in while it's hot, and uh, we'll, we'll see how our membership list expands in coming months. Dave Chisholm. Over to you for Ottawa Skies to January. Thank you, Mick. So let's see uh, what's happening in January. We're almost halfway through. And all these uh, slides that I'm about to show you now will be in astronauts. So uh, uh, don't, don't fear. I'm going to be going through them fairly quickly. First thing, I had this in the December slides, but I've also put them in the slides for this month. This is the planet visibility for 2024. It's a good thing to look at as we plan our star parties and outreach and so on. Uh, in terms of the phases of the moon, I'm sorry, I have the yellow circle on the wrong date. I always put it on the first Friday of the month, but you can see we had a new moon yesterday and uh, we got a full moon. Full moon is coming up on January the 25th and it's known by the early indigenous communities as the wolf moon, because this is the time of the year when the hungry wolf packs howled outside their camps. It's also been known as the old moon and the moon after Yule. Uh, sorry, you missed it. Um, actually, you can't see the date. Chris, if you can drag the uh, picture to maybe to the lower right-hand corner. Uh, there we go. Um, sorry, you missed it, but this was in last month's slides as well, the quantum meteor shower where it was on the third and fourth, it may still be some up there. It's cloudy anyways, yes. Uh, as you can see, the days are getting longer as we move through the month. Uh, Mercury, we have a greatest Western elongation. That means you'll be able to see it just before sunrise. It rises before the sun on January the 12th. Uh, Venus is visible before sunrise. Mars is rising and setting with the sun this month. Jupiter is visible in the evening sky. It's nice and high up in the sky right now. Uh, Saturn's visible in the early evening. It's, it sets, uh, it's setting now um, about uh, probably around 8 o'clock. So uh, you need to sort of get out uh, a little bit earlier to see Saturn. Uranus is visible in the evening. Neptune's visible in the early evening. And uh, this is the uh, cartoon of the month. Thought that was appropriate. Thank you. And with that, I'll introduce our first speaker for the night, uh, Paul Cloninger. Again, for the new folks here, one of our frequent presenters, avid astrophotographer, longtime observer, and tonight covering. Canada's geology and skies. I'll certainly give it a try. Especially after uh, my bad case of internetus interruptus in October. Kind of scuttled my, uh, my, uh, my uh, chance to give that the presentation then. But that's okay because it's evolved a fair bit since, uh, since my first attempt. And uh, talking with Mick just before the meeting started, uh, I may actually divide this in two uh, because we do have a nasty coming in. Uh, in terms of the storm that's supposed to hit us in the next few hours there. And uh, so I think we're going to try to probably er end the meeting a little bit early. So um, I'll find a logical break here and, uh, and probably divide this presentation into two as well there. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. In the meantime, good evening, everyone, and welcome to 2024. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the holidays and uh, wish you all a happy new year and uh, hopefully some clear skies ahead. So tonight's presentation um, deals with some trips I've taken over the last number of years. Uh, I've had several occasions to travel up through northern Ontario and uh, to the western reaches of our lovely uh, country uh, by road. Uh, the past summer was particularly nice with a month-long 11,000-kilometer road trip that took me through some interesting uh, areas for exploration of both land and sky. 
I thought I'd share some of what I've seen and learned in these trips by doing a bit of a travelogue tonight. I was originally planning to show uh, sites uh, visited right on through to the mountains of British Columbia. This was in my first rev, um, but soon realized that that was probably a bit too ambitious uh, for one presentation. So uh, I'll leave that portion to a later time as well there. And, uh, and as I say, I may have to divide tonight's there as well. Seeing, we'll see how it unfolds. So, oh, and I have to do the clicker here, don't I? Right. Oh, there we go. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. So uh, astronomy allows us to explore and understand the wonders of uh, places and things in, 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 that are far away in space and time. And oops, I'm just going to actually, I like that we've dimmed the lights there, but I do need to read my notes. <laughs> That's okay. I, I came prepared. Set you up there. So as I say, astronomy allows us to explore uh, and understand places that are far away in space and time, uh, be they alien suns, uh, planets and moons, uh, nebulae and star forming regions, and galaxies. They're all out there for our curious eyes and cameras. In Canada, we're lucky to live in or near large tracts of, of sparsely populated uh, areas that all offer some wonderful dark skies. Uh, for our celestial explorations. We also have the good fortune of finding ourselves living on an expansive ancient building block of this planet that has undergone enormous uh, transformation since its earliest times. Our location offers many signs of the home planet's very evolution. Geology provides us with a time capsule of sorts to places and events that are distant in time, and, but spatially right at our feet, so to speak. Astronomy and geology are therefore entangled, and together they provide us with a more fuller understanding of our place in the universe. This is one of the reasons we travel to asteroids such as Bennu to retrieve samples of the earliest material of the solar nebula. Such bodies are believed to be remnants of the formation of our planetary system, and unlike Earth, have no large-scale dynamic processes at play to rework the materials that comprise them. They're physical examples of the materials that have been orbiting the sun relatively undisturbed for about 4.6 billion years. My hat's off to the many thousands of people that made the OSIRIS-REx mission possible and to the su successful return last September of about 250 grams uh, of Bennu's surface. Some interesting science will surely come from the analysis of that material over the next while, refining our understanding of how we came to be here. So to put my travel images into a bit of context, I need to dig into some of what we know about the geology of this great land we live on, because it has certainly metamorphosized over time. It's seen the warmth of tropical uh, rainforests to the frigid cold of seemingly endless Arctic expanses and everything in between, including being covered over at times by ancient seas and kilometer thick sheets of ice. Vast mountain ranges have grown at its margins and have subsequently been ground down by the passage of time. How could this land have experienced such a diversity of form? For answers, we need to look far back in time. Early Earth consisted of an undifferentiated mass of largely molten matter created by the accretion of materials from planetesimals, asteroids, comets, and meteoroids uh, circling the sun in the primitive solar system and colliding with the nascent Earth. After this initial formation, our planet and, uh, and, under, and, and under the force of gravity, the lighter elements gradually migrated towards the Earth's surface and it was this process that began the differentiation of Earth's surface into continental and oceanic crusts. The lightest materials constitute the continental crust, and they remain at the surface and prefer, preserve some record of the long history of Earth's construction. The materials that constitute the crust that now lies beneath the oceans are somewhat denser. The continual release of heat from the decay of radiogenic elements at the Earth's interior takes place along the seafloor in the middle of the oceans. And it's this process that causes the continental tectonic plates to move across the Earth's surface at rates of about 3 to 15 centimeters per year, or about the width of a sheet or two of paper every day. Did you know you were moving? No? No? Our North American continent was assembled from such drifting continental fragments by this process that was believed uh, to have started more than 3 billion years ago uh, when the production of the continental crust first began. 
However, there aren't many places on Earth where you can readily find such and study such ancient rocks. This is due to the constant dynamic reworking of the crust, where old crustal material is subducted, essentially plowed under uh, the, into the interior, and new crustal material forms and is pushed up along oceanic spreading ridges. <clears throat> Excuse me. As a result, our knowledge of the deep past is not as detailed as that of the more recent half billion years or so for which we have access to more well-preserved rock strata that tell us their tales. Fortunately, the geological shields of Canada, Australia, and Africa do contain very old rocks. In fact, the oldest found on our planet so far. Some are in excess of 4 billion years old and show us glimpses back into those distant times. To that end, this time lapse I'm going to show uh, models the evolution and movements of the major tectonic plates and continental land masses riding atop them. The sequence begins at about 550 million years ago, uh, considered the boundary between Precambrian and the Cambrian eras, and extends to the present time. It demarcates the beginning of what is referred to as the Cambrian explosion, the area when truly multicellular life forms and animals with shells and exoskeletons first appeared on Earth. Those hard body types made their preservation as fossils in the rocks possible. And so most of the fossil record that we see today stems almost entirely from that time onwards. If you look closely as the animation runs, you'll see the outlines of some modern day countries such as Canada and even the approximate locations of a few major uh, large modern day cities on these evolving land masses. The appearance makes it very obvious that things were not always as they appear today. Uh, one note before I run this, this mapping is a Mercator projection of the whole Earth, and in these types of projections, large land masses that appear near the polar regions at the top and the bottom of the, of the map get increasingly distorted and exaggerated in size. Land masses closer to the equator, basically running through the horizontal center line of the image, suffer little from this exaggeration. Dark blue areas represent the deep oceans, whereas light blue areas indicate shallow seas. Green tones, uh, excuse me, represent low-lying land masses with ascending elevations from yellow, orange to brown, and glaciated sea uh, regions are shown in white. So we'll give this a run. Keep your eye on Canada's outline, and you'll see that not only was our country equatorial at times, but also submerged underwater at other times and covered by glaciers in even other eras. This constant motion of the tectonic plates continuously reshaped the dry land masses, causing enormous mountain building events, the merging and splitting of continental blocks, the creation and extin extinction of vast inland seas, and some large fluctuations in global climate seen over the span of time. When I look at this, I, 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 I'm fascinated by the areas we call inland seas because they have no modern day analog uh, on planet Earth. These are vast seas uh, dividing continents, um, but by most estimates, they were, they were also very shallow, 10, 10, maybe 10 to 30 meters in depth as compared to the oceans that we have uh, on Earth today. So they're not oceans, they're, they're inland shallow seas. And sh certainly uh, for those that occurred near the equator, they must have been like enormous swimming pools with, with the warmth. You can see it's uh, this, this earth is very dynamic. It just keeps moving. And that that's not something that just happened in the past. As I mentioned, it's ongoing now. Let's see, we're coming up to the modern times here. And there we are. So here we are today in this uh, snapshot in time of Earth's going on, uh, ongoing evolution. When we look at the major entities on Earth that share common geological attributes, such as the types of rocks, the age of the strata, and the structural style, we see there are six major ge geological divisions referred to as provinces. They are the shields. These are exposed Precambrian crystalline igneous and metamorphic rocks that form tectonically stable areas, such as the Canadian shield. Platforms. These are horizontal or gently lying sedimentary strata covering a basement of igneous or metamorphic rocks, such as Canada's interior platform seen in our western prairies. Origins. These are large scale linear or arc shaped formations where the continental crust has been folded, deformed, and uplifted to form mountain ranges. 
such as those on our east and west coast. The process of building such mountain, enormous mountain ranges is called an orogeny. And I'll refer to uh, uh, one of, in, especially in, in, in tonight's presentation called the Grenville orogeny, which affected uh, our, our, our portion of the planet. It occurred about 1.3 to 1 billion years ago and was responsible for beginning the formation of some of North America's Eastern mountain ranges that include the long since eroded Grenville Mountains and today the Laurentians, the Adirondacks and the Appalachian Mountains. Finally, ba or basins, th these are low lying formations of rock strata created by tectonic warping uh, of previously horizontal strata. They're often associated with or subcomponents of large platform regions. Then we have large igneous provinces. Here are large accumulations of igneous rocks that base, uh, typically occur over geologically relatively short periods of time and in, include intrusive features such as sills and dikes or extrusive volcanic rock formations such as lava flows. And finally, we have the extended crust. This is the continental crust that has been thinned due, the, uh, due to the extensional sh strain of shifting tectonic plates, such as the continental shelf off the east coast of North America. So here we see the major geological divisions of present day Canada. And my talk this evening focuses on what geological surface expressions and evidence we can see when exploring various locations within the Canadian shield. Hand in hand with those explorations, uh, I have some examples and thoughts on the night skies that I've observed uh, uh, along my travels out to the Western regions. So the Canadian Shield occupies the center of our country. However, this just refers to the visible portion of the outcrop areas. Rocks of the Shield actually underlie the interior of the, of the continent beneath the Rocky Mountains, as well as the interior plains of Canada and the US, where the sedimentary rocks of the interior platform have overlain them in time. The Shield is composed of ancient rocks, such as marble, granite, and gneiss, some of the oldest rocks on Earth. By, by the way, that's nice spelled G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, not N-I-C-E, but they pronounce the same apparently. <laughs> These rocks are largely metamorphic, meaning they've been transformed by heat and pressure over many millions of years. The assembly of the Canadian Shield involved the collision and buildup of a large number of tectonic plates beginning more than 3 billion years ago, and was mostly completed by around 800 million years ago. The cores of most of the world's major continents uh, were actually created by the same tectonic processes. So Ontario is a huge province that offers many outstanding locations to explore the geological evolution of our planet from the ancient Precambrian times to the very recent retreat of the last ice age. These are some of the locations I wanna to touch on tonight. Uh, my starting point is my home and observatory located on the periphery of the Canadian Shield uh, in the Lanark Highlands, some 65 kilometers southwest of downtown Ottawa, and about 20 kilometers southwest of our club's observatory uh, complex at FLO. There I enjoyed uh, Bortle 3.5 sky conditions on the best of nights, granting me wonderful opportunities for celestial exploration and imaging, many of which I've shared here over the years. The area also has a rich and diverse geological history and has in the past experienced volcanic activity, continental collisions, glaciation, and inundation by ancient inland seas. Even on my property, I see signs of the retreat of the last Ice Age's glaciers in the form of glacial erratics. These are boulders of varying composition and size, carried down from the distant northerly locations by advancing ice sheets, <clears throat> excuse me, and then later deposited on site as the ice melted and the land warmed. Within a handful of kilometers from my home are a variety of outcrops, some overlain by thin layers of soil and others bare. The inclined angles of their internal layers, as well as their current physical orientations, attest to the tremendous forces that have acted on them, both during their formation and then long afterwards due to tectonic movements. I, 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 find, I find some of these outcrops, as I say, only a few kilometers from my place, very dramatic because the, when you see it in three dimensions, you can see the strata, how, how they've been uplifted or tilted 
And uh, the amount of force required to do that is, is, is phenomenal. You can just picture that if you can sort of fast forward that process in your mind, these things basically being pushed up by the forces from below. In the regions stretching southwest of Ottawa, we are fortunate to have numerous locations of interest from both the astronomical and geological perspectives. Surprisingly, perhaps, one doesn't need to travel too far from Ottawa to get under some very dark skies. Darker, in fact, than uh, I've learned than in many other parts of our country, surprisingly. For those of you new to astronomy, the Bordel map here shows the levels of light pollution in the region, with the dark colors representing the darkest skies and with increasing light pollution corresponding to the yellow through orange, red, and finally white shades. For the ast for, from the astronomical perspective, our Fred Lawson Observatory, the North Frontenac Dark Sky Preserve, the Lennox Addington Dark Sky Viewing Area, Foy Mount, and the affectionately named Nirvana Site at the abandoned Irvine Lake Airstrip near Bon Echo Provincial Park, all offer great dark skies, popular with many of our seasoned observers. This, uh, this all sky view and panorama gives, uh, pa panorama gives you a bit of a feel for the kind of sky you can for, uh, find at the Bortle 2.5 Nirvana site on a clear moonless night. It's a very fine sight indeed for, uh, <clears throat> for imaging with no traffic running through it. And the two small light domes that you see there are from Belleville and Kingston, but they really don't have any effect. I shot this with a, with a Ricoh Theta X camera, which allows me to do 360 degree panoramas all the way around, up and down. Uh, I was out on the site with, uh, with Oscar back in uh, November, and uh, we had a very clear night, as you can see here, and, and it is very, very dark there. It's a great site. The, uh, if you put yourself on the airstrip there or on, uh, on its grassy margins there, um, the trees, uh, as you can see on the horizon there, they're, they're not really an issue at all. They don't block much of the sky. And you can see, uh, as you saw in, this, uh, in, in, the, in the original 360 view and in the, in the panorama here, um, you get a view of the Milky Way from horizon to horizon, which is really a nice thing. Just let that complete its run there. Now we've gone 360 degrees. <clears throat> so the Nirvana site can be reached from Ottawa by way of two routes. The southern route follows Highway 417 to, to Highway 7, and then heading north on Highway 41 to Caledar. That route is 209 kilometers long and requires about a two and a half hour uh, uh, trip. The northern route is about 30 kilometers and 20 minutes shorter and takes you along roads less traveled. 417 takes you up to Renfrew, where you then connect to Highway 132. That highway ends at Highway 41, which you then follow south and turn off on the Irvine Lake Road. Following that road for 2.3 kilometers brings you to the northern end of the abandoned airstrip on your right, uh, where you can set up your gear, as I say, either on the paved tarmac or on the adjacent grassy fields. I, I'm being very specific about the location here because for one thing, it is a premium dark sky location located very near to us, relatively speaking. But also there are four sites uh, that are very interesting. They, they're, they're, they give telltale geological glimpses into the past and they're marked here in the white areas between Nirvana itself and Kaladar. So just 15 kilometers south of the Nirvana site lies a very dramatic representation of the Canadian Shield in Bon Echo Provincial Park. During major or orogenic mountain building events involving the collision of tectonic plates, these deep -seated melt the deep-seated melting of rocks creates upward movements of large granitic magma intrusions called plutons. About a billion years ago, much of what is now southern Ontario was invaded by magma from below creating what is referred to as the Abnagur Granite Pluton. Uh, it's exposed along that 100 meter high cliff face of the Mazinaw Rock on the east side of Mazinaw Lake. That cliff face is actually a fault that cleaves the uh, Abnagur Granite into two. The granite on the west has long since uh, basically dropped down several hundred meters and shifted somewhat to the north, explaining why there's no cliff face on the west side of the lake. But that process only took place about 200 million years ago, long after the Pluton first formed. And it was a result of the plate movements that separated North America from Europe to form the Atlantic Ocean. The present day lake is quite deep, almost 120 meters, 
and is a remnant of the glacial Lake Iroquois, <clears throat> excuse me, the ancestor to Lake Ontario. It covered the entire area about 12,000 years ago. Just above the waterline at Mazinar Rock, you can see numerous rock painting, paintings believed to be at least several hundred, mil, several hundred years old and created by the indigenous people inhabiting the region at this time. They were made using red ochre pigments created from the iron rich rocks that are common in this area. This site is of cultural and, significance, uh, and spiritual significance to the present day Anishinaabe people. And it was really saddening to hear that some of these drawings were vandalized this past September. Hopefully they can be restored for future generations to treasure. Heading south of, from Von Echo Park, about two kilometers south of the village of Cloyne, there lies a very old remnant of basaltic lava, a type known as pillow lava. It was formed on this site about 1.3 billion years ago when ancestral North America collided with the large landmass that is now South America. That process, believed to be similar to, to what occurs today along the westernmost part of the Pacific Ocean, where the Pacific Plate slides downward below the Asian crust and creates island arcs, such as Japan. You can almost feel the heat coming off that lava after all that time when you stand on it. Maybe that's just my imagination, I don't know. Further south on Highway 41, about uh, 1.5 kilometers north of Northbrook, there can also be found some of the best examples in Southern Ontario of rocks that were heated and deformed to various degrees after their formation. During the mountain building era of the Grenville Orogeny a billion or so years ago, many, many sedimentary rocks were compressed, buried, and then metamorphosed as the plate tectonics moved, continuing to drive North and South America together. The end products are referred to as metasedimentary rocks. It's often difficult to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to identify the original rock types in such formations because the degree of metamorphosis uh, can be very great. At this site, however, there are excellent outcrops of largely undeformed conglomerates of nice cobbles and quartzite floating in a dark matrix. However, there's a sharp contrast to these further down the road, about four kilo or three kilometers north of Caledar. There, the cobbles show a notice noticeably higher degree of deformation, uh, many appearing as ellipsoid teardrops. This is a direct result of the tectonic processes that stretch them like putty. Uh, in some cases, the cobbles have been flattened entirely and create colored bands in, in the gneiss. All in all, a very interesting uh, region for a, a number of different types of geological explorations. So about 130 kilometers southwest of Ottawa and 30 kilometers north of Kingston lies a subtle, but to the astronomically minded, an interesting geological feature, the Holofort Crater. This ancient celestial scar is pretty well healed over since its creation, but if one knows where to look, the shallow depression that's still visible hints at the impact site. An on-site historical plaque marks the location and provides the following description of the area. A meteorite traveling 55,000 kilometers per hour smashed into the earth here eons ago, blasting a hole 244 meters deep and two and a half kilometers wide. Aerial photographs revealed the crater in 1955, and since then scientists have pieced together much of its geological history. Analysis of drill samples suggests that the meteorite struck in the late Precambrian or early Cambrian period between 450 and 650 million years ago. At first, the depression filled with water becoming a circular lake. Later, Paleozoic seas swept in sediments, filling the crater to its present depth of only about 30 meters. The, expos the, explosive impact, <clears throat> excuse me, the explosive impact of the meteorite, estimated to have been about 90 meters in diameter, is still evident in the hundreds of feet of shattered rock that drilling has detected beneath the original crater floor. A more recent an analysis of, of this site actually puts the, the original crater at about 1.9 kilometers across and uh, with an impact thought to have occurred about uh, 489 to 500 million years ago, so a little bit more recent. So this site, while not really dramatic, can certainly prod one's imagination to picture, to, to picture what happened here on that fateful day long ago. Continuing westward along Highway 7 towards the town of Marmora, this area is said to be one of the most geologically diverse places in all of Ontario. 
The area straddles the contact zone between the Precambrian rocks of the Canadian Shield uh, to the north and the Paleozoic limestones to the south. It contains a wide variety of metamorphous igneous, volcanic, and sedimentary rock in a fairly compact area. One of the features I found really intriguing was the presence of the Marmora ash beds, shown here. The ash beds are seen, you can see here on, in this close-up, uh, you can see them as whitish-gray layers within, within the Paleozoic limestone. And they originate from, a violent, from violent volcanic eruptions that occurred about 447 million years ago, the largest such eruptions within the last 600 million years anywhere on Earth. This, this one's mind-blowing. It, 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 it's been estimated that the eruptions pulverized and spewed up to 1,500 cubic kilometers of rock into the atmosphere. For comparison, Mount St. Helens that erupted in the US in 1980 involved 0 0.2 cubic kilometers of rock. So just, just enormous, uh, uh, an enormous eruptions that, that have no analog in the present. Over, the time, over, uh, over time, the volcanic ash here, it's been weathered to a very sticky clay called bentonite. La the layers in, the, in Marmora era are only a few centimeters thick, but in other areas believed to have been closer to the original eruption sites, Layers over two meters thick extend over many thousands of kilometers and have, uh, were, have been discovered. Just north of Marmora lay some eye-catching examples of ancient sediment sedimentary rocks called turbotites. These were formed by avalanching of sediments downslope into, into the water of a billion-year-old ocean that once covered this region. Turbotites typically form thin beds and are mostly made of sandstone and siltstone. And beautiful folds such as these are, are typical. Again, hard to imagine rock being bent like that, like putty. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also in the area are many occurrences of quartz intrusions varying from very, very fine to, to quite coarse. These veins formed when minerals such as quartz precipitated or intruded into uh, crevices or fractures in the host rock and later solidified. Further on to the east, 35 kilometers to the northeast of Peterborough lies the Petroglyphs Provincial Park. It contains the largest collection of ancient First Nations petroglyphs or rock carvings uh, in Canada, dating back to between 800 and 1100 AD. The petroglyphs were carved into white marble outcrop of the central metasedimentary belt and cover an area of about 35 to 60 meters. They've been encased in a wonderful, mostly glass, environmentally controlled building to protect them from erosion by the elements. The rock itself that they were carved into is estimated to be about 1.1 billion years old. The carvings depict various symbols and figures of humans and animals related to the spirituality and culture of the Algonquian people who created them. This, this is just a wonderful site to, to, to visit and explore, providing a snapshot of, of, a, of, a, of an ancient time in geological history, overlain by a peak into much more recent, but still to us a fair ways back, indigenous history. The park also features a diverse natural environment with rock, rocky ridges, wetlands, forests, and a wide variety of wildlife. All right, I'm gonna. How are we doing there, Nick? About ten minutes. Okay, so I'm 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 sort of trying dynamically trying to. Yeah. Okay. Trying to figure out a dynamic break here. So I think yeah, I think I've got a good one here. So from the petroglyph site, I'm going to jump northwest to what I think is one of the most interesting areas in Ontario, both from the astronomical and geological perspectives. It's the tip of the Bruce Peninsula. However, there are just too many <laughs> wonderful geological sites of interest to properly describe here tonight. So uh, I'll leave that aspect for another time and only scratch the surface for now, lest Mick or Chris bring out the hook on me. Uh, so the peninsula itself is a projection of the Niagara Escarpment and separates Georgian Bay from Lake Huron. The bedrock found throughout the Bruce Peninsula Park is called dolomite, which is a form of limestone that was formed as part of a tropical sea that covered most of Canada 430 million years ago. You can see the location of the park here marked by, by the little red X. Again, this is 
these these are the these ancient seas that I mentioned previously that were shallow and in this case very tropically oriented. They must have been very warm, a lot warmer than it is outside tonight anyway. The rock is fairly soft and uh, it's been extensively sculpted through erosion by water. This this process has given rise to many prominent cliffs uh, and numerous caves uh, that line its edges, as well as caves below the waterline, some of which I've actually had the opportunity to explore using scuba gear. The Bruce Peninsula Park and the Fathom 5 National Marine Park are part of the UNESCO Niagara Escarpment World Biosphere Reserve, and the parks are a mecca for campers, hikers, and scuba divers. The reason I couldn't skip over this area entirely tonight is because of its astronomical perspective. Much of the tip of the peninsula is protected from development by the national and provincial parks and nature reserves that have been created there. Only small communities uh, dot the peninsula, and since it is a peninsula, there are only large bodies of water flanking its sides, Lake Huron to the west and Georgian Bay to the east. This makes for some very dark skies up there. A number of years ago, I visited the west side of the peninsula, uh, looking out over Lake Huron at Cape Heard, and set up for a night of observing and imaging. It was a superb night, with excellent seeing and transparency conditions, no wind and mild temperatures, and very, very dark. In truth, in all my years of observing, I feel this site is one of the two best sites in Canada for dark skies that I've ever experienced directly. Absolutely no other people, houses, cars, or distant light domes were present to generate extraneous light. The Milky Way actually cast shadows that night. I'd never seen that before. This mosaic captured there uh, remains my favorite, my favorite version of, of shot of our galaxy, even though my equipment and processing techniques have evolved substantially since that time. This is definitely a site I plan to return to possibly even uh, this summer for some deep imaging. I think what I'll do, Mick, is I'm going to do one, one more site here, and we'll cap it at that, if that works for you. Okay, that, that'll give me a logical break. I couldn't pass this one up here. Jumping from the Bruce Peninsula, uh, uh, a fair ways north, uh, I, I head up to parts of northern Ontario for the rest of this presentation, which I, the remainder of which I'll give uh, hopefully maybe next month. We'll see. Uh, my first stop lies some 80 kilometers to the southeast of North Bay uh, in Algonquin Park, near the small seasonal community of Brent. There lies the remnant of another uh, ancient meteoric blast, the Brent Crater. And as you can see from the Bortle map, this site is also in a region of some very dark skies. The Brent Crater is uh, circled uh, up uh, near the top of the image. The Brent impact occurred about 450 million years ago, some 40 or 50 million years after the Holoford crater was formed. And as with Holoford, the region was covered by a shallow tropical sea at the time. Larger in size than the Holoford crater near Kingston, its diameter is about 3.4 kilometers. And like Holoford, this crater is also a bit difficult to, do, to discern. But an observation tower erected on the crater's eastern rim provides a look over the tree cover and it reveals a portion of the distant western rim. The original crater was at least 600 meters deep and surrounded by a rim of up to 100 meters in height. At the present time, the bowl-shaped depression is filled with about 250 meters of marine limestones that were deposited after the original impact. Those rocks in turn rest on 600 meters of brecciated rock, including a layer of fractured and partially melted rock called suvite. Since the area was covered by a sea at the time of impact, the crater was actually formed on a sea floor. Marine sediments then partially filled the crater and protected it from deep erosion, especially by the Ice Age glaciers of the last two million years. Unlike the Holoford site, there is a hiking trail here that allows visitors to explore the interior floor. It leads to the, to the floor and, and an outcrop of brecciated rock thought to have landslided down from the crater rim. Two small lakes, Gilmore and Tecumseh also are located on the floor. The, cr the crater's floor and the two uh, lakes, unfortunately, are not visible from, from the actual observing tower because of the tree cover. And it's pretty extensive up that way. 
About six kilometers south of the crater lies the small community of Brent on Cedar Lake. This is essentially a small seasonal recreational campsite with some park services and is also an access point to the interior of Algonquin Park. Note that there is no phone or cell cellular service available here. Camping on the shore of Cedar Lake does provide a nice view out south across the lake. As I mentioned, the skies are very dark here. In, in this view captured in the summer of 2018, Mars and Saturn were prominent additions to the Milky Way. Though there were some low lying clouds that evening, the sky at high, higher elevations was inky black and very transparent. Okay, so I think I will break there because from here, the rest of my presentation jumps up to northern regions of nor, uh, northern Ontario, but as north as you can get actually by road. Uh, and also west along the, the shoreline of Lake Superior, where we have some really dramatic uh, uh, views uh, of the of exposed Canadian Shield strata. It's it's what you picture when you think of Canadian Shield. So I will defer those to a later time. And uh, uh, if there's time for questions, I shall I'd certainly be pleased, pleased to try to answer that. Yeah. You're welcome. To be continued. To be continued. Uh, Chris, do we have uh, any remote questions for Paul? Um, yes, we have a comment. Was that a bad echo? Uh, first of all, a comment from Simon Hanmer. What a wonderful overview of the Southern Ontario geology. Very neatly keyed into astronomy. Paul has really done his homework and his enthusiasm is indeed infectious. Then we have a comment from Rob Dick. Let's just change screens to find it. Uh, just reinforcing your comment on the Bruce Peninsula, that it's an RASC dark sky preserve. It's also recognized by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Well, thank, thank you very much. And uh, Simon, I, I have a, I have a, oops, I have a question for you. I won't ask it now, but there's there's one site that I'll show on 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 Rev two. Maybe I can talk to you before I show that next part, uh, where I'm really quite curious as to how that formed. And I figured if anybody knows, you do. So I'm going to pick your brains and I'll send you an image. Everybody else, take care on your drive home tonight. Uh, it will be messy, I think. Again, Paul, thank you very much. So yes, Chris, whoops, this on. Oh, that's on. Uh, so yes, let's skip to the break. And the rest of the museum is closed, but the toilets are open. So that's the good news for tonight. And uh, Paul, did you walk off with the clicker? <laughs> yeah, what are you gonna do with that at home? Huh? Alrighty, um, so I'll be giving out tickets for the door prizes. The table on the far left there is take whatever you want from there. The table on this side is the door prizes, in, except for the little box for donations, but that's mine. Uh, amongst the, the kit on the giveaway table are copies of this DVD that was produced by Frank Roy last year. And it's a really good compilation of the history of the original North River Observatory and its migration to what's now become the Fred Lossing Observatory, FLO. So if you history and trivia buffs out there, there's copies of this on the giveaway table. And there are other classics such as the Observer's Handbook for 2002, which I expect there's going to be a bit of a scramble to uh, try and get hold of this gem, but um, may the strongest prevail. So then, question, Georgium Cetus, I think is an absolutely splendid name for an astronomical object, in this case a planet, but alas, it didn't stand. What classical name has replaced Georgium Cetus for a, one of the planets in our solar system? So if we can break until 8.30 and then we'll kick off with um, Jim's presentation. Thank you very much. We're all happy. All righty.
Thank you, Chris. Yes, so um, George Imsitis, a uh, bit of uh, brown nosing by William Herschel, George III, George's star, alas, it became Uranus. So there you go. We live in a dull world. Jim. Lee, your anatomy of a sunspot. It sounds like something out of Sherlock Holmes, the dynamic of super asteroids. Great. Good evening, everybody. I'll try to keep uh, it under uh, an hour and a half. Is that okay for everybody? Excellent. Pubs will still be open, yes. So welcome tonight to my talk entitled Anatomy of a Sunspot. As many of you are probably already aware, sunspots are probably the most easily observable feature on the sun. But have you ever wondered what exactly are they? In tonight's talk, I will attempt to answer that question. I will start with a quick summary of how the sun works, followed by a review of sunspot observations made through time. Then I'll present the current theory about how sunspots work, followed by my own attempt at visualizing a sunspot in 3D. So let's begin with a little solar trivia. Our sun is fairly typical for the stars in the Milky Way, being rather average in terms of mass, about 300,000 times the Earth's mass, and radius, about 109 times the Earth's radius. It is made roughly of 75% hydrogen and 24% helium gas, and is about halfway through the main sequence or hydrogen fusing portion of its life. By the way, that black arrow with the word us beside it is what the Earth looks like to scale next to the sun. If we cut a pie slice out of the sun, this is what scientists think it would look like. The inner 25% is called a core and is where all of the fusion is taking place. The core is a very intense place, having a temperature over 10 million Kelvin and pressure 10 billion times that of the Earth's atmosphere at sea level. The Earth, by the way, has a radius of 6.4 megameters to put things into perspective. From 25% out to 75% of the sun's radius is the radiative zone. Gamma rays coming from the core are constantly absorbed in this layer and re-radiated until eventually photons make their way to the layer above after many tens of thousands of years. At the top of this layer, the temperature is still very high at around 4 million Kelvin and the pressure has only dropped to around 0.1 billion atmospheres. The outer 25% of the sun is called the convective zone. Energy is very rapidly carried across this layer to the sun's visible surface via buoyancy-driven movement of the gas. As a result, there is a very steep decline in both temperature and pressure as we move across this layer. Of primary interest to us amateur astronomers is the very thin layers above the convective zone, a piece of which I have zoomed in on here. 10,000 kilometers below the sun's visible surface, temperature is greatly reduced from deeper in the interior, being around 30,000 Kelvin. The density of the sun's gases at this point is around one-tenth of what they are on Earth at sea level. The photosphere starts at the point where the gas has cooled, enough for it to be no longer ionized, that is to say, cool enough for the atomic nuclei to reclaim their orbiting electrons. Photons are able to travel through the gas much more easily when it is not ionized. So from our vantage point, this layer seems to be where all of the sun's light is coming from. 500 kilometers above the start of the photosphere, 
is the start of the chromosphere. This is the point where the gas temperature begins to rise again. By the time we get to the transition layer, about 2,500 kilometers above the photosphere, the temperature has already risen back up to around 30,000 Kelvin. Across the thin transition layer itself, there is a sudden jump in temperature. The resulting corona gas temperatures are in the area of 1 million Kelvin. As we travel through the photosphere to the chromosphere and finally to the corona, there is a very rapid decrease in pressure and density. This will be important later, and there will be a test. The final thing to note on this slide is that forces driving the motion of the gas differ depending on what layer they are in. In the convective zone, gases are driven primarily by momentum and buoyancy forces. In the photosphere, gas motion is driven by a combination of temperature and magnetic forces. And finally, in the chromosphere, gas motion is driven primarily by magnetic fields. The final physical property of the sun I would like to talk about tonight is the fact that it is a giant dynamo. Astronomers have known this since the first observation of the sun's corona during an eclipse. The sun's magnetic field lines are clearly visible to the naked eye during this event. It has been known since 1820 that the flow of an electric current induces a magnetic field, and the sun is a big ball of rotating plasma, so mystery solved, right? Uh, unfortunately, no. The sun's magnetic field is not as simple as that. In 1934, British astronomer Thomas Cowling published a theory that states that an axisymmetric magnetic field, like that of the sun, cannot be self-sustaining. The so-called Cowling's anti-dynamo theorem. I'll talk more about this conundrum a little later. Now, let's jump into our time machine and go back and review some sunspot observations from the past. Now, we could go all the way back to 800 BC when the first mention of sunspots being observed was recorded in China. But instead, let's only go as far back as 1610. If we were to stop at the garden of English astronomer Thomas Harriot, we'd see someone looking at the sun through some strange new device called a telescope. Harriet was the first person to record observations made of the sun using a telescope. He made 690 written observations in his lifetime, including 199 drawings of sunspots. He also noted that the spots moved in such a way that the sun must be rotating. Curiously, Harriet made his observations by looking directly at the sun through his telescope. Perhaps the quality of his optics were poor. Otherwise, the reason he didn't go blind is, is a mystery. Whatever the reason for Harriet's good fortune, for goodness sake, never look at the sun without proper protective equipment. Most of the sun observing in the 17th and 18th centuries was done using a safer technique of telescope rear projection. The technique allows for relatively easy sketching of sunspots, as shown by the gentleman demonstrating in the photo. Because of the quality of optics at the time, it was most common to use slow focal ratio scopes, so a small ratio between focal length and diameter. The image at right is a reproduction of the type of scope that was used at the time, made by Ken Spencer in 2021. The scope has a one-inch aperture and one-meter focal length. Harriet was not the only person observing sunspots with a telescope in the early 17th century. The Frisian brothers Johann and David Fabricius were making observations, as well as German Christoph Scheiner and, of course, Galileo Galilei. Galileo published his sunspot observations in a series of letters in 1612. 
he confirmed Harriet's observations, stating that the sun must be a rotating sphere with sunspots located on its surface. Galileo also entered into a critical exchange of letters with Shiner, who had an opposing view of the nature of sunspots. Observations of sunspots continued through the rest of the 17th and 18th centuries, but now let's jump 230 years forward to when things really start to get interesting. In 1843 Germany, amateur astronomer Samuel Heinrich Schwab published an interesting letter on the subject of sunspot numbers. He recorded daily observations of the sun for 17 years and determined that sunspot numbers varied on a 10-year cycle. Swiss astronomer Rudolf Wolf found Schwab's letter inspiring and took it upon himself to compile 40 years worth of sunspot data, refining Schwab's cycle to 11 years. The solar cycle numbering system that we use today is the same one devised by Wolf, by the way. A few decades later, English astronomer Richard Carrington discovered that there was a pattern to where on the sun's disk sunspots appeared over the course of the 11-year cycle. Carrington's research was later refined by German astronomer Gustav Spurer. At the start of a solar cycle, sunspots predominantly appear at high latitudes, around 30 degrees, and then gradually transition to appearing at lower latitudes as the cycle progresses. The resulting distribution of sunspots when plotted versus time is called a butterfly diagram, and this sunspot behavior is now called Spurrer's Law. I thought it would be interesting to see if I can corroborate Spurrer's Law with recent observations. Here are four images of the sun captured over the last five and a half years. I don't have any of my own observations from 2020 showing the full disk, so I have inserted one taken by the Solar Dynamics Observatory in the US. I also haven't captured any recent solar images, so I borrowed one from fellow Ottawa RASC member Jim Sophia. If I add lines over top, representing the sun's equator and 30 degree latitude lines, we can make some observations. In May 2018, the active regions observed were relatively small, without sunspots, and close to the equator. This suggests these active regions were the tail end of the preceding cycle. By June 2020, we are starting to see small sunspots forming near the 30 degree latitude line, indicating the start of our current solar cycle. The image from March 2022 shows a marked increase in activity, with large active regions at both high and mid latitudes. Jim's image from three weeks ago shows even more activity, again distributed across high and mid latitudes. It would appear from these observations that we are still climbing towards the sun's activity peak, which is good news for us solar, uh, solar buffs. Eventually though, in another five or six years, sunspots will be smaller, fewer, and will only appear close to the sun's equator, marking the end of solar cycle 25. Along with the advances in our understanding of how sunspots behave, made during the 19th century, came some important improvements in the available observing technologies. The quality of telescope optics had improved significantly, allowing for much sharper and higher resolution observations. John Herschel came up with the idea for the solar wedge in the 1830s, a device that allows for safe direct viewing of the sun. The unit pictured on the right is the particular model of solar wedge that I use. More important than the solar wedge was the invention of spectroscopy and its rigorous application by Robert Bunsen and Gustav Kirchhoff in the 1850s to the remote identification of chemical elements. 
which brings us to California in the early 20th century. When George Ellery Hale first proposed that there is a link between sunspots and the sun's magnetic field. He used a spectroscope designed for looking at the sun, a spectroheliscope, to make his observations. The results of his work are the laws of polarity, which read as follows. Sunspots often appear in pairs lying close together and roughly in line with the sun's rotation direction. The pairs are polar opposites and almost always show the same pattern in each hemisphere. Polarity patterns in one hemisphere are the reverse in the other. And the polarities reverse from one cycle to the next, resulting in an overall 22-year solar magnetic cycle. Hale's discovery of the laws of polarity depended entirely on a new observing technique that allows one to actually see magnetism. For those of you who are not already aware, a spectroscope is an instrument that splits up the light coming in from a telescope and allows the astronomer to observe one narrow wavelength slice at a time. For example, the slice corresponding to the emission of a known element. The emission lines are a result of the photons given off by an atom when its electrons drop down to their normal orbital position after being excited by some outside energy source. It so happens that the wavelength of the light given off is affected by whether or not the transition occurs in the presence of a strong magnetic field, the so-called Zeeman effect, named after Dutch physicist Pieter Zeeman. It turns out that this effect can be used in conjunction with a spectroscope and some polarizing filters to create magnetograms, maps of magnetic field strength and polarity. The example magnetograms shown here in the lower right compare the sun from around solar maximum to around solar minimum. You can see there's a pretty obvious difference. White in the picture denotes positive magnetic polarity and black denotes negative. This new technique really opened the door to understanding the solar cycle. One last important observation that we should discuss is differential rotation. Early observers, including Galileo, noted that sunspots move at different speeds depending on their latitude. Because the sun is a ball of gas, it does not rotate like a solid body. The sun's equator takes 25 days to rotate once, but its poles take around 36 days. This difference in rotation rate is believed to be due to angular momentum being redistributed by the sun's convective zone. The development of helioseismology in the 1970s has allowed astronomers to further characterize differential rotation below the sun's surface. It apparently only occurs in the convective zone, with the radiative zone underneath rotating more like a solid body. As you might imagine, the interface between these two zones, called the tachocline, is very complex and thought to play an important role in the sun's magnetic cycle. Speaking of which, let's make one final stop using our time machine, California in 1960, where we will pay a visit to Horace Welcome Babcock. That is indeed his middle name, Welcome. Babcock was a Caltech and University of California at Berkeley educated astronomer. He was the first to propose the idea of adaptive optics, which are key to many uh, land observing sites today. He also specialized in spectroscopy and measuring the magnetic fields of stars. He was the first person to propose a model for sunspots and the 22-year magnetic cycle. 
His model goes like this. In step one, Babcock assumed the sun has a simple bipolar magnetic field at the start of a new cycle. The mechanism sustaining this bipolar field was unknown in Babcock's time. Recall Cowling's theorem that I mentioned earlier. Nonetheless, Babcock assumed that it existed and that its field lines passed through the sun relatively close to the surface, specifically within the convective zone. In step two, Babcock describes how the sun's differential rotation results in the field lines getting drawn around the sun's circumference. Over time, the field lines wrap completely around the sun multiple times, forming a toroidal magnetic field. Neighboring field lines are assumed to get twisted around each other, again due to the differential rotation, as well as Coriolis forces, forming magnetic flux ropes. These flux ropes concentrate the local magnetic field strength to several orders of magnitude larger than the surrounding environment. In step three, the field strength in the ropes reaches some threshold value, and the ropes begin to rise to the photosphere due to magnetic and thermal buoyancy forces. Eventually, the flux ropes break the surface of the photosphere, forming a bipolar magnetic region, or BMR, that continues to grow in size and, if strong enough, form sunspots. The preceding and following parts of the BMR have magnetic polarities defined by the orientation of the original field lines. Exposed flux ropes form rapidly growing loops as they enter into the low-density chromosphere and corona. In the final step, Babcock proposed that the flux loops continue to expand until they connect with the field lines of the original bipolar field, eventually causing complete field polarity reversal. There is a lot of debate over this step. And it is now believed to be much more complex than what Bob, uh, Babcock proposed. There is at least some agreement that it is the interaction between the toroidal magnetic field that grows during the cycle and the combination of convection and Coriolis effects that results in the dynamo action that generates the sun's bipolar field. The math of which is very complicated. So, what all this boils down to is that a sunspot is the visual result of a magnetic flux rope emerging into the photosphere. The flux ropes expand as they exit the photosphere due to the rapid decrease in gas pressure and density, resulting in the trumpet shape shown in this figure. The tightly spaced flux rope fibers inhibit convection trying to come up from underneath. Thus, sunspots are cooler by a few thousand Kelvin and appear darker. The heat that would normally exit the photosphere in the sunspot's location is redirected to the sunspot's perimeter. Thus, features called faculae and plages are hotter and look brighter. In fact, the amount of extra energy flow coming from the faculae and plages is more than the deficit created by the sunspot. The sun's total energy output is higher during periods of active sunspot creation. So, now we have an idea of what sunspots are. Let's try to apply this new knowledge to interpreting this bipolar magnetic region, or BMR, that I imaged on April 16th of this year. This active region is in the northern hemisphere making the preceding spot positive polarity for this cycle and the following spot negative. The increased energy flux around the sunspots is not visible in the white light image on the left, but it is visible in the calcium 2K image in the upper right and the hydrogen alpha image in the lower right. 
The sunspot umbra, the dark central part, is where the flux rope, rope fibers are too tightly spaced to allow for convection to come up from below. The penumbra does not look as dark as the umbra because the flux rope fibers are spaced further apart, allowing some convection to get through in between fibers. The black specks are called pores and indicate where smaller flux threads have broken away from the main rope. The small repeating pattern that we see all over the surface of the photosphere is called granulation. It is a visualization of the smallest convection scale size on the sun. Each granule measures around one and a half megameters in diameter, making the earth about this big for comparison. To help further visualize what is going on around a sunspot, I have adapted this simple schematic of the sun's atmosphere viewed edge on. I use the word simple here only half jokingly as a complete description of the situation is rather more complex. The main thing to note from this figure is that magnetic activity occurs on the sun's surface at a wide range of magnitude and size scales. Low intensity magnetic fields, see if the laser works, sort of along here, right above the granulation, they are constantly being formed, destroyed, and moved around on the same distance and time scales as the granulation itself. Those weak fields gradually get swept by convection towards the edges of supergranules. So towards like this way, where a supergranule is the next larger scale size um, eddy in the um, in the convection flow immediately underneath of the, the uh, granulation at the surface. These swept up fields form what is called the quiet sun's magnetic network. And it exists over the entire sphere of the sun and is visible all the time. The interface between the weak field and the dominated, the, sorry, the weak field dominated zone and the magnetic network dominated zone so this sort of area along here is called the fluctosphere. At the bottom of the convective zone, we can see a wound up flux rope that has risen and exited the photosphere on the right side of the schematic. Where it exits the photosphere, it has a magnetic flux magnitude one or two orders of magnitude stronger than the quiet sun network. The presence of this strong, expanding magnetic field affects everything around it, including the field lines of the quiet sun network. The wide range of physical scales and flux magnitudes present on the sun makes measurements and computer simulations extremely difficult. That is one of the main reasons why there is still a lot of debate on how the sun works. One of the aspects of solar observing that I really find fascinating is the fact that by using readily available equipment, an amateur, like myself, can observe the bottom of the, sorry, can observe the different layers of the solar atmosphere. With visible light, we can observe the bottom of the photosphere where sunspots and granulation are clearly visible. Using calcium K, we can observe the lower chromosphere, the zone identified on the previous slide as the fluctosphere. And finally, using a hydrogen alpha filter, we can observe the middle and upper chromospheres where the solar atmosphere has become increasingly more ionized and larger scale structures are visible like fibrils, filaments, and prominences. The features we can observe at these three levels are interconnected by magnetic fields that start at the photosphere and stretch all the way out into the corona. As an experiment, I have attempted to further illustrate this interconnection by rendering this particular sunspot group in 3D. 
the photosphere layer is rendered from my 540 nanometer wavelength image captured using the Bader brand solar wedge that I showed you earlier. 540 nanometers is squarely in the green part of the spectrum, which is why I've colored this layer green. In this layer, brighter is hotter, but also higher in altitude. Thus, the sunspots appear as dark depressions in the otherwise hot, bubbly surface. Adding the fluctosphere layer from the calcium 2K image, we can now see some lines of brighter and thus hotter material aligned with the boundaries of the supergranules, the quiet sun network that I mentioned earlier. You can see the outline here. That's a supergranule. This is a supergranule. This is a supergranule up here, over here. So they're clearly visible in calcium K. Finally, using a hydrogen alpha filter, we can observe the middle and upper chromospheres where the solar atmosphere has become, oops, sorry, missed my spot. Finally, adding the chromosphere layer from the hydrogen alpha image, we can see that there are now lots of large laterally oriented structures. The ridges seen here are from fibrils, part of the quiet sun network. Note how they seem to be arranged in a spiraling radial pattern around the sunspots, especially the spot on the right. This is a clear indication of the expanding flux rope influencing the surrounding material. There were no filaments visible around this particular sunspot group, but if there were, we would see a much larger ridge of laterally oriented material at this level. Another interesting feature of the chromosphere layer is the very bright spikes. If we look at all three layers edge on, we can see that these few very bright peaks visible in the chromosphere appear to be an amalgamation of the more distributed bright peaks from the fluctosphere layer. Evidence again of the emerging flux ropes influence on the quiet sun's network magnetic field lines. Note that in reality, these layers are separated by the distance on the order of less than one of the granules that we see in the photosphere layer, a distance of around a thousand kilometers. Well, that is about it for my presentation. I do have a few closing remarks though. The sun is a complex and ever-changing object which in my mind makes it a fascinating target for observation. As I have described tonight, careful observation by numerous earthbound astronomers has led us to some level of understanding about what sunspots are and how the, the sun's 22 year magnetic cycle works. Many of the observations leading to these discoveries can be made today by amateurs like you and me using reasonably affordable equipment. So I say, give it a try. I'm sure you will enjoy it as much as I do. For those interested, I have included a list at the end of my presentation of all the references that I used in preparation of the talk. Some of the references like Babcock's original 1960 paper are worth a read if you are interested in the sun. I've already passed this list along to Gordon to publish in Astronotes. Thank you for listening. If anybody has a question, I'd be happy to answer. Sure. I think he's going to bring you a microphone. Okay, that's on. Where are we? Thank you. It's a wonderful presentation. My question is, I understand the up and down in a loop, but what happens if there's a super large or a small single isolated sunspot? How does the flux rope 
fit into that? The well, it's always a loop, even though the um, the visual representation that we see uh, in the visual band may be only a single sunspot, it is still a bipolar magnetic region. So even though um, we don't see two sunspots, there is an, a plus and a minus polarity part of a loop. So it's always a loop. There just isn't always a sunspot. It depends on the strength of the where the rope comes through. And there's a lot more information in the, the papers and the references uh, that talk about the spot that is uh, in the direction of the rotation tends to be more cohesive. The one that's trailing tends to break up quickly. And so it's not uncommon to see one spot where the trailing spot has broken up. It's not being held together. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Got questions? Chris, do we have anyone online with questions? No, many positive comments, but no questions. All right. Well, well, thank you very much. Thank you again. Yes. In uh, if you're trying to make an analogy with like a bar magnet, like you use in science class when you're a kid, then yes, the north pole on the magnet is what we would call the positive polarity and the negative is the south. And it has to do with uh, the orientation of the magnetic field. Does the sun flip its magnetic field with the Earth then? It does. Every 11 years, it flips. That's part of the, the controversy. <laughs> How does a magnetic field continue to generate itself and then flip and then regenerate itself again. Why does that keep happening over and over again? Because there's no outside influence. It's all due to what's happening in the sun. And it's a mystery still. Because they can't simulate it, it's such a complex problem mathematically. The, the range of scales you have to be able to model makes it enormous. The amount of memory you need and the power of the machine is too great to model it strictly physically correct. So they have to make uh, simplifications in the model and they're they're missing the physics when they do that. So lots of debate on that. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you move us along, Chris? Uh, sorry, we do have one more question. Uh, with respect to the Earth's magnetic field, we don't understand how, why it flips. I guess that's a true statement. Uh, sorry, and that was a comment from Simon Hanmer. Yeah, okay. So, right. Okay. We have two observations now, Chris. Okay, so order of appearance will be Jim, Andrea, Richard, Oscar, and Bob, if you can sort of get yourselves ready. Jim? Unmissable big Excellent, excellent, very good. Hi, everybody. So uh, what you're looking at is is Messier one. A little closer. How's that? So this is Messier one, the Crab Nebula, which is a supernova remnant, approximately sixty five hundred light years from Earth, and it's in the constellation Taurus. This image was taken off my south balcony here in town with an eight inch Smith Cassegrain telescope and the Mallinckham Sky Raider camera. I used a quad band light pollution filter uh, for this image. And a number of frames were stacked using uh, auto stackers and post processed in Topaz Studio 2. And on to the next one. This is NGC 2237, the Rosette Nebula, captured with the uh, Mallinckham uh, Sky Raider 432 mono camera 
which has a, a Sony IMX432 sensor that, that captured more detail, in my opinion, than I normally get uh, uh, capturing the rosette with my color camera. I used uh, uh, William Optics uh, 61 millimeter refractor at f4.9, along with an H alpha filter. The frames were stacked in Deep Sky Stacker and post processed using uh, Topaz Studio 2. Thank you. Right, next, I believe. Those are beautiful, Jim. Um, so there were three clear nights in all of December. This was one of them, December 13th. It was really, really cold, and I got some geminid meteors from my backyard, which I was quite pleased with. Uh, right there, you can see where Gemini is. I just caught it as Gemini was rising, and then my camera died. And then... I went out the next night, which was a lot less cool, thankfully. And this was looking south towards the city, and I got a few as well. And I put all the details about how I took this photo and processed it on the Discord. So you'll have to come to the Discord. And I, those same evenings, I was also shooting Deep Sky. So the 13th and the 14th, I imaged the Deer Lick. <laughs> Galaxy group, and you'll see there's a whole bunch of little small galaxies known as the fleas. And this is uh, located in Pegasus. And I can tell you how I took this picture on the Discord. And I did also um, find this new thing in PixInsight, which allows me to annotate everything. And I'm, I'm pretty happy about that because you can see all the galaxies. Now, very close to this galaxy, is another little group of galaxies known as Stefan's Quintet. And as the name suggests, it's a group of five galaxies, although you can see there's another little one up at the top. Now, the, the yellowish galaxies are actually gravitationally linked. It's the Hickson something group, a common group, compact group. That's the one. Thank you. And the blue galaxy is unrelated. The blue galaxy is 40 million light years away, and the yellowish ones are, they estimate, be 290 million light years away. And again, I can do this plate solving thing, and that's really fun. Now, this data, uh, just, well, I can tell you all about that on, on the Discord, never mind. Um, so these, these two areas are related in the sky. They're very close to each other, but they're really hard to get in one frame because they're just that too far apart. But it turns out that I was able to, I did a perfect mosaic without even planning it and they matched up perfectly. So this is how they relate in the sky together, the deer lick and the quintet. And I still can't believe it all matched. So this was wonderful. And my final image is, is kind of a wacky take on the horse head. I know it's strange looking. This is the horse head. Uh, it's a narrow band image in sulfur, hydrogen, hydrogen. So SHH. So I put the sulfur data in the red channel and I put hydrogen in the blue and the green. And this was a color palette I saw on Astro Bin, so I really liked it. And what surprised me the most was that red glowy area. If you look at your traditional horse head image, this is a blue reflection nebula. And I thought it's a blue nebula. It's not a narrow band nebula, but clearly it's full of sulfur. And that was kind of interesting. And so this is the horse head uh, through my um, C11 telescope. And that's the end for me. Andrea, we have a question from Paul Sadler. Did Pix Insight auto annotate the photos or are you manually adding the labels? No, I, you do. Uh, there's a, a script called image solver, which most people do because then you can do um, spectrographic color calibration. But then there's a little button there that you can click annotate and it just annotates it for you. So PixInsight did it from after it solved the image. Thank <laughs> you.
Okay, here's a repeat of Jim Sophia's. <laughs> anyway, first of all, I have to apologize for the cloudy nights for the past month. Um, I'm afraid after having a lovely experience with one of the telescopes from the Ted Bean Lone Library, a Celestron C8, I decided, yes, this is what I wanted. And so I went out and bought one of my own. <laughs> and ever since, we've been having so many cloudy nights, I haven't had much chance to use it. But uh, the night of the 19th of December was particularly uh, productive for me. So uh, I was trying out the 8-inch Schmidt Cassegrain with a 0.63 focal reducer so I could get a bit wider field of view. Um, but this is with my ASI 178MC planetary camera. <clears throat> but the thing I really love about this camera is that it, it does get the red, um, the deep red colors very nicely. And it's uh, got quite a large number of pixels, so I can get quite a good resolution on these images from it. And the Crab Nebula is pretty small, more like the size of a planet, so uh, it worked out very well for me. And then after that being my main target, uh, when I was just about ready to pack up, I noticed that Orion was beautifully placed in my backyard, right between a pair of trees, which normally obstruct an awful lot of the sky for me. So with Orion right there, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll go ahead and take a few more pictures of that. So the same settings with the focal reducer and the planetary camera. But of course, uh, the Orion Nebula is so much brighter than the Crab Nebula that I had to um, put the exposure down to 10 seconds. So very quickly, I managed to get a stack of about 60 light frames. <clears throat> But what I really liked about this image was the amount of detail in that um, inner nebula just around the trapezium. And if you remember, I think about a year ago, Oscar gave us the trapezium as the, as the um, challenge object for the month. And it was very difficult to get a good picture of the trapezium because they're really brilliant uh, newborn stars and they light up the nebula around them so brightly that you really have to cut back on your exposure a lot. So I was quite happy to see that I, I, I got that just beautifully in this image and so much detail and so many new little stars in amongst this, a very beautiful object even though I've thrown away <laughs> the huge surrounding nebula that you see in many other images. So of course I came back to it. <laughs> uh, my daughter gave me yet another piece of equipment for Christmas and this allowed me to attach my Canon M100 camera to the same uh, optical configuration with the focal reducer on the 8-inch Schmidt Cassegrain and the um, M100 camera has a much larger sensor chip, so it gets a much bigger field of view. So this is a stack of 26 13-second exposures. I was hoping to do a lot more, but the one little problem with the Canon camera is that it's a general purpose camera. It's not really designed for astronomical work, and <clears throat> it doesn't like the cold. So I set it up to take a whole sequence of pictures and after two or three shots, it would just shut itself off. <laughs> and I would have to go back out and push the buttons, reset it, start it up again, take another few pictures and it would shut down again. And after only uh, 36 of these shots, I shut down. <laughs> anyway, the other um, interesting difference uh, between these two pictures is that the um, the Canon camera, again, being a general purpose, not a not adapted camera, it doesn't pick up anything in the deep red area. It's really primarily for the <clears throat> central part of the spectrum, the greens and blues. So uh, it really makes a nice view that's quite similar to what you see with your eye because your eye is also much more sensitive to greens than the, the reds. So when you're looking through a telescope at the Orion Nebula, this area is what you, you see. But of course, the real reason I got the telescope was that it does beautiful work on uh, the planets. I can put a Barlow lens on it and zoom right in and get some lovely detail on Jupiter, which is beautifully high overhead. 
uh, in the early evening right now. So uh, these are just a couple of recent shots. <clears throat> That's Io near the, the shadow of Io near the red spot. And this was the night of um, the 13th again, December 13th, when, uh, no, no, sorry, no, this, this is the 19th. <clears throat> and we've got Europa on the left, Io on the right, and Ganymede is the moon that's just dis just about to disappear behind the limb. So my plan next month is to give a more detailed talk about how I capture and process these planetary images. And uh, perhaps sometime we'll be able to work out how I can do a workshop on this. But I'll, I'll give a, an introduction next, week, next uh, month to how to do planetary capture and processing. So that's all for this time. All right. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, so yeah, I've just got one image this month. It's uh, this image here of the uh, California Nebula, otherwise cataloged as NGC 1499 or SH2220. Uh, it's an emission nebula in the constellation Perseus. And its name comes from the fact uh, that uh, it sort of resembles the uh, the state of California. If you were to, if this was north and south and then the Pacific coast along here. Um, a fun fact though, is that by mere coincidence, uh, the, the declination of this object makes it such that uh, this object transits uh, along the zenith in central California, which is which is kind of cool. Um, so it's about two and a half degrees long, and it's it's quite a difficult object to observe visually due to its uh, low surface brightness, um, and it also gets uh, swamped out by the brightness of, of that star there, which is uh, which is uh, Psi Persei or or Menkib. Um, so this image here, it's an integration of about 106 uh, three-minute sub-exposures for about five hours and 18 minutes of total exposure. Uh, was taken back in November, the 12th and 20th of November. Um, I haven't been out much since then since because it's been so cloudy. Thank you, uh, Richard. Um, and it was uh, taken, it was actually the first light image for, uh, for a camera I bought back in September, uh, ZWASI 2600 MC Pro. Uh, taken with a 80 millimeter uh, refractor, the Skywatcher Equinox ADED at F5. All right, cool. That's it for me this month. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you, Oscar. Thank you to all the presenters. And who's walked off with the clicker? In my shadow. Very good. And Bob. What do you do? Um, M103 is an open cluster containing a few hundred stars, and it's about uh, a, hundred, a thousand light years distant from Earth. The red giant in the center of the cluster makes us a very pretty uh, sight. Next, please. The blue snowball is a planetary nebula first discovered by William Herschel. We've heard his name again before. We've heard his name tonight. In 1784, the telescope appears in the telescope. It appears as a bright blue spot. It is about 6,000 light years from Earth. Blue spots are not very interesting. So let's see what it looks like if we crop it a stupid amount. Okay. The central star in the nebula is a dwarf star with 5,000 times the luminosity of our own sun, but only 60% of its mass. The blue color is caused by the stellar winds from the star striking the previously ejected mass. Interestingly, the star at the top of the image appears to be a close double star. Next, please. NGC uh, 1275 is a type of Seifert galaxy located about 237 uh, million light years away. In this image, there are many galaxies. So which one is 1275? Next image. Here you go. It contains 13 billion solar masses of molecular hydrogen. This gas is feeding uh, its active nucleus 
and its active star formation. Next slide. I mentioned that there are many galaxies in this image, but how can we tell galaxies from stars? Simple, I can use software to remove the stars. What you see are galaxies. Next image, please. Uh, NGC 2403 is 8 million light years from Earth. It is a member of the M81 galaxy group. This galaxy is the first outside of our own local group within which Cepheid variable stars were discovered. Cepheids have a period of pulsing, which is directly related to their absolute brightness, which allows us to use them to calculate distance. So after the Andromeda galaxy, NGC 2403 was the first galaxy that we had some kind of accurate idea of how far away it is. Thank you. Thank Enjoy you. the Thank snow. You, <laughs> okay, observing okay. challenges. Oscar, I heard a rumor that you're rerunning the ones from December, or was that? Yes. Okay, so rather than uh, labor the point, Messier 72, NGC 7331, NGC 1275 and the Lunar Challenge being the Crater Franklin. Good luck. Whoa, hang on, what in there? Ah, sorry, we got the whole stack from December, gotcha. Okay, so current month then, Messier 103, open cluster, uh, NGC 7662, the Blue Snowball, MAFE 1, Elliptical in Cassiopeia, and the Lunar Challenge being Steinhardt, the crater in the southeastern highlands of the moon. So thank you, Oscar, and again, good luck. And okay, so an announcement. Uh, coming up January 25th in this very venue, our good hosts here at CASM have a public event uh, on lunar exploration. Uh, they've got two uh, eminent scientists coming in, James Green, fr formerly from NASA, and Carolyn Emmanuel Morissette, uh, who's with the Canadian Space Agency to discuss current and future trends in lunar exploration. So spread the word and everyone is invited. There we go. There's our, the PA, the, the Nick, bio. while yeah. you leave that slide there, I want to go back to Bob Olson and there's a question that just came in. Sure. Which software did you use to remove the stars from the galaxies, please? Now is Bob listening? Yes. Uh, yeah. I used uh, a, a program from Russell Croman called uh, Star Exterminator. And it's an AI program, and it does a fabulous job. And somehow it's able to tell its tell the difference between little galaxies, little galaxies and stars. It's a fabulous program. Did you present on that a while back, Bob? Uh, yes, long time ago. <laughs> oh, I was in, in the course of last year, yeah? Yeah, sure. Yeah, all right, so thanks. You're welcome. Uh, library is open at the back here. Uh, Stell's pick of the month, missions to Mars. Uh, Ongoing saga. Our Fred Lossing Observatory, remember it's a, a members only facility out near Almont. A number of fixed um, telescopes, they're available for use by members. Bring your own kid, you can bring guests. Yes? Yeah, please. About the Fred Lossing Observatory, we are expecting um, a fair amount of snow tonight. Um, so Rick is uh, go going to be having the, the road into FLO plowed probably early tomorrow morning. And he's looking for volunteers. He would like some help in clearing the snow off the observing mounds and off the roofs of the observatory. So if anybody has some time this weekend, it would be greatly appreciated for having some help with the snow clearing. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. And Mick, going back to the uh, question to Bob, we have a comment in from Richard Wagner. 
that StarNet is a free similar package to Star Exterminator works just as well. Okay, thank you. Alrighty, so yes, FLO, we have members only uh, viewing nights, the next of which is tomorrow, hence the uh, concerns about snow removal. Uh, Gordon, do we have any feel for the weather? No, it won't be looking good. Thought so, but I had to ask. Alrighty, so post meeting refreshments at the Liam Maguire's of uh, St. Laurent. I uh, don't know about you, I'm not going out drinking beer with this weather coming down, but who knows. And our thanks to our uh, ongoing volunteers who support the whole program. Uh, Rick as FLO director, Estelle for the, the library out here, Peter Schutten, who's not with us tonight, but uh, managing the Ted Bean Telescope Library. Uh, do we have Anne here? No. Okay, so coffee and conversation won't be happening. Uh, and Art Fraser managing the, the membership information. Uh, 39 here at Chasm, 45 on Zoom, 84. Not bad. Uh, thanks to all the speakers tonight, including myself, and uh, the RASC National Office for their continued support with providing the Zoom facilities for us. As usual, comments, suggestions to me, meeting chair, at ottawa.rasc.ca. And the next meeting, three weeks away, Friday, February 2nd, same bat time, same bat channel, same location. And I wish you all good night, safe drive home, and uh, see you in February. Cheers. <laughs>